Look at South Australia, mostly heating 100% renewable electricity. Look at Tasmania, running on 100% renewable energy. Yes, we can. In Australia, we're already doing it in some states. We are already doing it. It's working. The future is here. We just need to step on the accelerator in other states. You know that feeling when it's so hot, your mouth is dry, your lips are dry, even your eyes are dry? You feel cooked? This is kind of how I felt about 20 years ago in my little French village. I remember I was out in the field, earthing the potatoes, and the wind was really hot on my face, and some of the dust was sticking to my face. I just felt really uncomfortable. And so I walked to the end of the row and drank from my water bottle. And I just spat it out. The water was hot like tea. Instead of going back to work, I walked to the reservoir and I just jumped into the water. The feeling of the cool water was refreshing and washed away some of the dust on my face. But as I sank my body into the cold water, I shivered. As I realized that this was not just the hottest year on record, but one of the coolest years to come. My family is from northeastern France. I grew up in the country on top of a hill with my parents growing trees and shrubs. This was my first recollection of a never seen before heat wave linked to climate change. Now here in Australia, we have experienced the bushfire, the drought, the floods, you name it. We all have direct experience of extreme weather events linked to climate change. Now how these events make you feel when you look back at them? I, I felt powerless and small. My family, they've had to adapt. When you work with living beings, you don't need to look at weather data to realize that the apple tree is blooming earlier, the grafting you used to do in summer doesn't quite work anymore, and the plants you just used to plant now need to be watered extensively. And so you adapt. You do grafting in winter, you rethink which species are adapted to the evolving climate, but I have to say, adaptation is pretty depressing. And most of us don't have the option to adapt. And in the end, we're just dealing the inevitable. And so I felt ignored by the politics and decision maker. I felt there was no lever for me to pull to drive change. It turns out I was quite wrong about that. All the narratives I was exposed to were telling me we can't do this. So prediction from the early 2000s estimated that by today, we could only displace one coal power plant per year globally with solar energy. Now, a few years later, when I attended a big solar energy conference, I sat down in this big amphitheater to listen to this leading international agency telling me that solar will keep being insignificant in the foreseeable future. It will only replace about one, three coal power plants per year globally. These predictions were wildly wrong. How much coal power plants did you replace per year last year with solar energy? 15 times that number, or more than 40 coal power plants. These predictions were linear or flat extrapolation, while the growth of solar energy is inherently exponential. So let's take a step back here. What do we mean by exponential growth? So first, linear thinking, linear growth. 
Imagine this is a piece of paper here, 0.1 millimeter thick. If I add another piece of paper, I have 0.2 millimeter. If I add two pieces of paper, I have 0.3 millimeter. If I add 10 pieces of paper, one millimeter. If I add 40, I have four millimeters. This is linear growth. Now, let's, instead of stacking the paper, let's fold the paper. Now, if I fold the paper once, a piece of paper once, I get 0.2 millimeter. Twice, I get 0.4. Three times, I get 0.8. Four times, I guess 1.6 millimeter. Now, if I do that 10 times, I guess 100 millimeter. If I fold it 42 times, I get 400,000 kilometer. I have reached the moon. This is the power of exponential growth. So, why, why were predictions so wrong? Well, one reason is that predictions are affected by our previous experience. And humanity has experienced many energy transitions before. In the 1900s, we had a transition to coal, with a doubling of capacity every about 20 years. In the 50s, 60s, 70s, we had a transition to oil and gas. Again, we had a doubling of capacity every 10 to 15 years. But what happened with solar and wind is that we have a doubling of capacity every two years. Let me repeat, every two years, we are doubling the amount of solar and wind installed globally. This is back to our piece of paper. We can reach the moon. And so why is this growth so fast? Well, the more we use coal, the more we have to dig coal. And every time we dig more coal, it becomes harder to dig coal. And so the price go up with increased capacity. But for solar and wind energy, it's the opposite. The more solar and wind energy we install, the cheaper they get, because solar and wind are on the learning curve. That means that the more solar and wind capacity we have, the cheaper solar and wind energy is. Not only that, but the learning rate of solar and wind energy is 28%, which is unheard of before. Now, why is this learning rate so high? The first reason is the economies of scale. You know, as you have larger scale, you're building a whole ecosystem of manufacturers, of suppliers, of installers, and that drives the cost down. Also, you are learning by doing. But the other element here is research and development. Research and development drives the learning curve as well. Now, I've been privileged here to be part of teams in Australia that have significantly contributed to modern photovoltaic technology. These are the type of solar panels that sits on your roof, crystalline silicon solar cell technology. And they sit on your roof for 25 years, and they're battered by wind, by sun, by rain, by snow, and they keep on churning out zero carbon electricity. Today, Solar and wind are the cheapest energy in history. And so you may ask, well, if solar and wind are the cheapest energy in history, why are we still doing research and development? Well, we need not only to decarbonize the electricity sector, but we need to decarbonize transport and we need to decarbonize industry. And for this to happen, we need the price of solar electricity to go where it never has before. My team at UNSW focus on making solar panels cheaper and more immune to degradation. We do this by looking at defects in solar panels. And these defects are the size of a single atom. It's like looking uh, at a, for a needle in a haystack. Actually, because solar panels are and silicon is the purest material we can synthesize, it's like looking 
for a needle in a million haystack. And when we find such defect, we remove them and we try to deactivate them so that panels are more immune to degradation. And that enables for higher efficiency solar technology. And every time the solar cell efficiency goes up, electrifying everything becomes easier. Suddenly, heating of buildings with renewable energy becomes cheaper than fossil fuel. And as we keep on increasing the efficiency, we unlock electric shipping, electric aviation, electric steel, electric cement. We can electrify everything. Now, I want to come back to the beginning of my talk here. My anecdotal recollection of the heat wave that affected my native country in 2003. Now, 14,000 people died from heat waves that year. These were our most vulnerable people, and we failed them. Now, I felt pretty hopeless. I felt there was no technology for us to transition to the zero carbon future. So what are the technological breakthroughs we need to tackle climate change today? There aren't any, none. We don't need to wait for breakthrough miracle technologies to continue decarbonizing our economy. All the technologies we need are mature. And the less mature keep on getting cheaper because we are doing research on this very sophisticated technology. Right now, as I speak, we have the cheapest form of energy in history. Okay, so, but you ask, can we really do this? Well, we don't have to look very far to have the answer. Look at South Australia, mostly heating 100% renewable electricity. Look at Tasmania, running on 100% renewable energy. Yes, we can. In Australia, we're already doing it in some states. We are already doing it. It's working. The future is here. We just need to step on the accelerator in other states. As William Gibson said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Here. We have the tools, we have agency. Let's make this future happen for everyone. The needs of the major economies can have a devastating impact on rights across the other side of the globe. But spirited insistence on those rights by Indigenous communities, facilitated by an interconnected world and consumers that care about rights, can have a tangible effect on some of the world's biggest companies who then apply this supply chain pressure up the line.